The father of five children had won a toy in a raffle. He called his kids together and asked them which one should get to keep it. Who's the most obedient, he asked. Who never talks back to mother? Who does everything she says? The five small voices all answered in unison, Okay, Dad, you get the toy. I just, that was not my message, but I'm sorry to say. One morning I was getting ready to come to work and I walked out of the garage and headed for my car and I heard my air conditioner unit rattling like you wouldn't believe. It was making the awfulest racket. I mean, it was, I'm surprised that the neighbors didn't come and bang on my door and complain because you could hear it for, you could hear it so far. And I, I just rolled my eyes and I thought, great, I'll have to call the air conditioner guy and I hope it's not something serious. I don't have to hope I don't have to replace the whole unit. How many years old is it? Anybody ever had to ever know what I'm talking about? And so I'm just I'm getting in the car and I started up the car and then it occurred to me, I wonder what's really wrong with that thing. And so I walked over, I got out of my car and I walked over to the air conditioner unit and I just put my hand on it and leaned on it and it got real quiet. I took my hand off and it started making this real loud racket. I put my hand on it again. It got real quiet. So I went into the garage and I got a screwdriver. <laughs> and I went around that thing, tightening, and with every, and it had a whole bunch of loose screws. Don't do that. Some of, some of the wives poking their husbands. Yeah, you have a loose <laughs> screw too. Um, and so I went around there, tightening up those screws, and with every screw I tightened, it got quieter and quieter and quieter until. It was purring like a kitten. All it took was a screwdriver. And what I thought was a very, very serious issue turned out to be not nearly so serious. It just needed to be tightened down. Today, guys, I want to talk to you about tightening down some of the areas of your life. I actually want to talk about four. And in honor of Father's Day, we are giving away these. No, it is not a space age. It's not a drone. It is a screwdriver. It has four bits in it. You pop one out and you stick it right there. That's magnetic. And then you can use it to tighten stuff down. So each guy gets one of these today as you leave. We would give it out earlier, but you'd be playing with it instead of listening to the <laughs> message. I know how guys are. There sometimes can be in the life of a man a lot of rattling going on that makes us think that a lot is wrong. Something really serious is wrong. My, my life is, is really seriously messed up. My marriage is messed up. My kids are messed up. My job is messed up. My life is really messed up. And sometimes, in reality, there are just some things that simply need to be tightened down. You tighten those down and your life might just actually purr like a kitten. I want to talk about four things that I have observed in the lives of men and in my own life that when you tighten them down, it's going to calm the rattling in your life. Number one, realize that you are a spiritual father. All of us, when we're talking about being a little bit unsettled, all of us have a need to be a blessing and to be a spiritual father or a spiritual voice or to be a blessing in someone else's life. In fact, when we talk about uh, spiritual growth and we talk about natural growth, one of the signs that, that a, a, um, a teenager or adolescent is coming into adulthood is when they stop thinking about themselves and start thinking about having a family, start thinking about someone else to care for. That's also true spiritually. We're, we're going to be covering that uh, next time in our spiritual growth series. But realize that you are a spiritual father. Not only do we have natural children, but we also have spiritual children. Would you hand me my phone, please, Dean? We also have spiritual children. You have a natural responsibility to your natural children, to take care of your natural children, to be a blessing to your natural children. But 
your natural children are also your spiritual children. So we're not just responsible for being sure that they have food, clothing, and shelter and go to a good college. We're also responsible to be sure that our children grow up to be godly and that our children grow up in the teaching and training of the Lord, Ephesians chapter 6 says. We're responsible to be examples, spiritual examples to our children and to be a blessing to them and to grow them up spiritually. Now, if you don't have natural children, there are men in here who do not have natural children. But let me say to you that you also have spiritual children. Spiritual children are important to you. We're going to read just a moment. Paul didn't have any natural children. And yet the Apostle Paul welcomed into his life spiritual children. I want to read to you a text that I received this morning from someone in our congregation. It said, Happy Father's Day, Pastor Steve. You are not only blessed to have uh, fathered awesome children, but also to have spiritually mentored disciples as a spiritual dad. Thanks. I love you. I pray that your day is full of joy, blessings, and a nap. But this is someone right here who recognized that I'm not one of your natural children. You didn't, your, uh, Pastor Connie didn't birth me. And at the same time, I recognize, my, recognize myself as one of your spiritual children. And I want to say to you men that you also have spiritual children. If you have natural children, they are your spiritual children. Don't neglect your children to raise up other spiritual children when you have spiritual children that need to be uh, natural children that need to be mentored spiritually. But if you don't have natural children or you no longer have natural children at home or, or whatever the case may be, then you need to realize that spiritually you can be responsible and you can be a blessing and you can leave a legacy in the lives of spiritual children. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul said, there are not many spiritual fathers. All kinds of natural fathers, but there aren't many spiritual fathers. And I want to challenge you, gentlemen, to be a spiritual father in someone's life. When you work in kids' ministry, when you work in 24-7, when you do tutoring at New Hope Village with those kids, vacation Bible school that comes, that's coming up, when you're involved in that, when you involve yourself in the lives of kids, you are affecting lives for eternity. You know, one of the things I love about our kids' ministry, I just, I've been itching to say this for a long time. You know one thing I love about our kids' ministry? That our children's ministry pastor doesn't look like a children's ministry pastor. He looks like a pirate. Some days he comes to work, he looks like a redneck. I'm trying to be kind, I'm trying to give him some, some leeway here. I mean, he's got a beard and he wears jeans and he even wears work boots to church. I love it. I love now listen, I, I, I know some great women children's ministry pastors. So I'm not saying, in fact, our student ministry pastor is a woman and she's, she's terrific. So I'm not taking anything away from that. But I love the fact that we have a man as the leader of that ministry and the fact that other men are drawn to him. I love having the presence of strong men in our children's ministry. I think it's healthy. So don't be weirded out by that. When you, if you're new and you took your kids back to the children's ministry and you went, whoa, that guy is in charge of the children's ministry? Oh, he, we ordained him as a pastor over the children's ministry and we're proud of it. We love this man. We love this ministry. And when you work in kids' ministry, when you work in any of these areas, when you work in, in like I said, New Hope Village, we're tutoring children there. You can get involved in that with our uh, outreach ministry. When you do that, you are leaving a legacy in the life of kids. You're affecting lives for eternity. And I, wanna, I just want to step out here, and I know this, this may seem a little quirky, but I want to say a word to the single moms in our congregation. This is Father's Day, but I, I want to take a moment to salute you because many the single moms end up being dads too. You end up being dad. I was raised by a single mom uh, until I went to college. My mom remarried a great man. Uh, they're still married today uh, after 40. They've been married as long. They got married the month after we did. So... 
42 years, and he, his name is Bill Hutton. He's a great man. And my mom, uh, but my mom raised me through, uh, through school, through high school, through college, uh, first part of college, uh, as a single mother. And uh, she had to be a dad, too. She had to do dad stuff. And, and, and dad stuff was not particularly comfortable for my mom. She wasn't, a, she wasn't a tomboy type. She was a, and so this was not, I remember being in Little League. And she'd go to my Little League games. She had no clue what was happening on the field at all. <laughs> but she would go and cheer me in. I would, I'd stand out in the outfield and say, I, I played outfield. I didn't have a dad to play catch with me. I didn't have a dad to teach me how to play baseball. I didn't have a, uh, you know, I didn't have a dad to, to do any of that stuff with. But, uh, but my mom got me on the team anyway, and I was in the outfield. And sometimes I'd be in the outfield. And one time I was out in the outfield, and I said, Hi, Mom! And the ball went right over my head. <laughs> I'm thankful, though. So, so I want to salute you, Amen. Uh, single moms. Um, yeah, that's appropriate. I remember, though, my little league coach. His name was Coach Kirby. And I remember Coach Kirby working with me. He, he would, uh, my mom would be sitting in the uh, parking lot waiting for me after little league practice and all the other kids were gone and my mom would wait in the, in the uh, parking lot for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I, don't, I was a kid, I don't remember. While Coach Kirby stayed late, just me and him, and he worked with me teaching me how to play baseball. And then we had another guy in our neighborhood, <laughs> great, big, heavy, bald guy. No, his name wasn't Willie. <laughs> his name was, we, I don't know what his name was. We called him Scritch. <laughs> Scritch Whitaker. I'll never forget Scritch Whitaker coming over to my house saying, hey, Stevie, you want to play some ball? And he would, he'd, uh, he'd stand out there without a glove, and I had my glove, and he would play baseball with me. I'm 62 years old next month, and I'm standing here in front of the congregation of this great church, and I'm remembering these two men who meant something in my life when I was just a kid. They made an impression on me. So there aren't many spiritual fathers, but you be one. You be one. So first of all, if you're going to tighten down the rattles in your life, you need to realize you are a spiritual father. Number two, forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 says to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So we need to, guys, guys are, are guys, we need to get better at this forgiveness thing. Let me, let me explain something to you. Men generally have more serious, this is going to freak you out when I say this. Everybody take a deep breath. Men generally have more serious emotional, uh, emotional issues than women do. Because we stuff our emotions and then pretend we don't have any. Our feelings, did you, men's feelings can get hurt just like women's can. It's just that when you hurt a woman's, woman's feelings, <laughs> our feelings have been hurt by our wives, by our kids. But because the general consensus in society is that women are the emotional ones, most of the times our feelings are ignored by our wives, by our kids, and even by us. We ignore them. It's not that women have more feelings. Women have been accused of having more feelings than men do. That's not true. It's not that women have more feelings, but women are so much better at expressing their feelings than men are. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, take a turn from this, though, because all the women are thinking, yeah, honey, I hope you're listening to this. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. Uh, gals, we are not only uncomfortable sharing our feelings, but sometimes you push us and push us and push us to do it when it's really not healthy. It's not healthy to try to get feelings out of someone who is not ready to share them. 
So I want to say to you that whether or not we choose to share our feelings with someone, whether or not we feel like, talk to me, talk about it. Come on, talk to me. Can't you talk about it? Can't you? That's what drives us underground. It's because you push us and push us and pressure us. You got to deal with your feelings. We are dealing with our feelings in a different way than you are. We stuff them. Well, that's not healthy. Well, let me tell you what else is not healthy. At least I get my feelings out, yeah, and, and I've got the scars to prove it. <laughs> so listen, uh, coming at people and, uh, uh, is not healthy. And at the same time, stuffing feelings maybe isn't healthy either. And both men and women need to learn how to deal with their feelings on their own timetable. So men, I want to say to, to this to you, whether or not you choose to share your feelings with someone, and you can choose not to, whether or not you choose to share your feelings with someone, whether you choose to talk about them or not, you don't have the right, we do not have the right to hold a grudge toward those that we are unwilling to communicate with. So if I'm not going to share my feelings with you and I, I'm upset and I'm going to stuff them, that's my right, that's my prerogative, stay out of my life. I have the right to do that, but that does not give me the right then to give people the silent treatment, being grouchy and mean and demanding because I decided to stuff my feelings rather than talk about them. Now, by the silent, now listen, women, by the silent treatment, I, that's different than thinking things over. Sometimes men don't communicate, not because they're trying to be rude, it's because they're thinking. They're thinking. He won't talk to me, he just, he's giving me the silent treatment. No, he just, he's trying to sort things out. He doesn't know what he wants to talk about. And so you need to give him space. And one of the reasons that men come back at you and they're angry with you is because you keep pushing them and pushing them. Talk to me. You got to talk to me. Don't be so quiet. You got to talk to me. I know something's wrong and you're not talking to me. You are going to talk to me. You're going to drive that man right out the door. So you just need to, you just need to back off and let him process. And the things that he's dealing with, he may never choose to talk to you about them. Now that does not give him the right to be mean, ugly, rude, Guys, doesn't give us the right to do that. And so some of us, our marriages are rattling simply because we decided to stuff feelings instead of talk about them, which is our right to do. But don't blame the person that you refuse to communicate with. Forgive those who have wronged you. If you talk about your feelings, forgive those who have wronged you. If you've decided not to talk about your feelings, you still have to forgive those who have wronged you. If you decided not to talk about it. So number two, forgiveness. Number three, don't provoke your children to anger. Ephesians chapter six, verse four says, do not provoke your children to anger. Parents, don't treat your children in such a way, this is the Good News Bible, do not treat your children in such a way as to make them angry. Instead, raise them with Christian discipline and instruction. Last week, uh, there was a, uh, a marriage therapist that was here with Mary and uh, she made, this was at second service. If you were at first service, you didn't hear it, but she came up and she gave a testimony about her, uh, her relationship, she and her husband's relationship with their son. And their son wanted to get an earring and the dad put his foot down and said, absolutely not. He was, how old was he, 14? Eight. He was eight. So anyway, the... Uh, you know, I could skip this part. If you've been in this church a month, you know where this is going. But anyway, uh, no, seriously, let me talk about this for a second because he was eight. And um, the, uh, the son wanted to get an earring. The dad put his foot down and said, absolutely not. And so Tina uh, took the dad aside and said, you know, is this really that big a deal? Because the Bible doesn't say anything one way or the other about whether or not uh, he should be able to get an earring. And I don't want to provoke my child to anger because he was really upset that he couldn't get an earring. And I don't want to provoke him to anger to the point that when he's 14 or 16 years old, he leaves the house in rebellion. So they talked about it and they decided to go ahead and let him get an earring. And then, uh, uh, then, then, then there's more to the story uh, that, that's not pertinent to what I want to talk about. Because what I want to talk about is that I believe that uh, she made a valid point. Uh, but I believe that she made that valid point 
maybe to the wrong group of people. Uh, because what we don't want is to create an atmosphere of teenagers in our church and even, even eight-year-olds who are saying, uh, you're provoking me to anger. And if I don't get my way, then I'm going to leave home. Uh, because there are situations when you just need to tell them, well, don't hit, let the door hit you in the rear on your way out. <laughs> I mean, there are, there are times that you, you need to say, these are our rules. This is what we have decided is best for you. And until you leave home, uh, this is, this is going to be God's will for you. Amen. And so you just got to <laughs> deal with it. Uh, so... Um, but I do think, so t teenagers that are in the congregation, you need to realize that whether or not uh, your parent is doing the right thing for you and whether or not your parent is provoking you to anger or whatever, is that is their call, not yours. And so you, you can ask, you can certainly make your case, but in the end, uh, it's the responsibility of children, the Bible says, not to negotiate with their parents, but to obey their, ch their parents. The Bible says that this is what is right in the Lord. I want to say to you, though, as parents, that when I was rearing our children, uh, I, have, I do have some regrets as a parent. I wasn't a bad parent. I was a good parent, uh, but uh, I would do some things differently. And one of the things I would do differently is not make such a big deal out of everything. Uh, when I was a parent, everything was a big deal. Everything was a big deal. Everything that I didn't want them to do was I didn't pick my battles. Every single thing I did not want them to do, I was determined to win. And no, you can't do this. And no, you can't do that. And no, you can't go here. And no, you can't wear that. And uh, they heard uh, in the course of their life at home, they probably heard 10 times more no's than they heard yeses. And I never, ever, ever gave in on anything. I never yielded on anything. It is my way or the highway, and if you don't like it, you can hit the road. It's awfully quiet in here. Um, I, was a, I was a very, very strict parent, and uh, if I had it to do over, I would have been a much more joyful parent. I would have been a much more happy parent, and I wouldn't have made everything such a big deal. Everything, now that I'm a grandparent and I'm watching why my kids and my kids, you know, my kids have grown up. I'm proud of all four of them. They're great kids. Uh, I love them. They've got great families. They're, they're great parents. I'm so impressed with my children's parenting skills. They're, they're so much better parents than I was. And I'm so thankful for that. And we did instill the word of God in them. And we were, uh, I would not have become a lenient parent. I wouldn't have become a uh, a very, very liberal, liberal parent with my children at all. But I, would, I would just wouldn't have treated everything as such a big deal, like, you know, if you, if you do this, then the whole world's going to crumble. And I, I just took things, I took myself, and I took these things way, way too seriously. And so I think this is what uh, Tina uh, was dealing with. This is what she was actually, uh, Tina Conkin, this is what she was talking about. And I think, parents, that we need to take that a heart, to heart, and we need to pick our battles. And there are some that we need to win. And then there, there's some that we just need to, you know, it's really not that big a deal. And that's up to you. That's not up to me. Should your child have an earring? That's not up to me. And that's not up to your child. That's up to you. And uh, I have a feeling that in my household today, they still wouldn't have one. But I think everything just became a, a big deal in my family. Does this make sense? Yeah. Do you guys, you understand what I'm saying? So um, one of the things that from uh, parenting classes that we have taught here at the church, one of the things that, uh, that I've really appreciated is being able to explain to our children the moral reason why. Uh, I grew up, when I was a child, I grew up in a household that when, I, when my mother told me to do something and I asked why, what did she say? Now, because I said so uh, is valid. You're the parent. And you can say that if you want. And, uh, and, and it's your right to say that. It's your right to parent that way. But the thing is, it doesn't teach our children to think. It doesn't teach our children to evaluate. Mommy, why do I have to brush my teeth? Because I said so. Well, do you realize there's a possibility they'll go to college and not brush their teeth once they get there? Because they don't know why. 
Why can't I go here? Because I said so. Why can't I do this? Because I said so. Why do I have to read that? Because I said so. And if they're doing everything because you said so, then one day they're going to move out of your house and they're not going to be in a, in a place where you can say so. They're going to have to make decisions on their own. They're going to have to think on their own. They're going to have to have the reasons why on their own. Now, you can say, because I said so, and if you don't want your, have your child to have an earring and they say, why? It's okay. You can say, because I don't want you to have one, because I said so. But I wouldn't parent that way. I did. I said that a lot when I, because I was raised that way. I said that a lot because I said so. And that doesn't raise uh, healthy kids who can then parent their own kids and understand why. Does that make sense to you? Um, when we're talking about don't provoke your, provoke your children to anger, let me leave this with you. Be kind to your children. Treat your children like Christians. One of my big things that I've talked about marriage a lot, when we talk about marriage, there is the Bible has some scriptures about marriage, but I'm amazed at how people have built whole ministries, whole, like Mark Gunger, they built whole marriage ministries when the Bible only has about 10 or 12 scriptures on marriage, and they built whole, whole ministries on marriage because they're not only using the scriptures about marriage, but they're using the scriptures about life and just being Christians in general. And I believe that if we would treat our spouses like Christians. Forget the marriage stuff. We just treat them like Christians. If we be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, if we would do that, then our marriages would probably go up three or four notches. So I want to say that about our children. Be kind to your children. Ephesians 4.32, tenderhearted, forgiving your children. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, we're God's children. And God is very kind to us. God has been very kind to me. I've done some very stupid things. Anybody here done anything stupid? Yeah. Just three of us. Well, I've never done anything stupid. Well, yeah, actually, you have. <laughs> and God has been very kind to me. God has been very gracious. God has been, uh, he just has not beat me up for the dumb things that I've done. You know, now, there are times that he has disciplined me, though. There are times when you're going to let this pass, aren't you, God? Nope. I'm not going to get by with that. And there are times God can, be, God can be a very serious disciplinarian. But it's not every little thing all the time. And he's been very gracious, very loving, very kind to me. And so let's be that way to our kids. Let's treat our kids like God treats us. Let's be strong disciplinarians when we need to. There are times you're going to have to put your foot down and say no. And you have to stick by your guns. And there are times when you don't be a lenient parent. And don't let your kids run the household. That's not what I'm talking about. But we need to be kind and tenderhearted and loving toward our kids. So that will, I believe if we'll do that, that will tighten down some of the rattling in our family. And then fourthly, the last one. Realize that God has destined you for greatness. And place that greatness on the inside of you, not in your outward circumstances. We can be so consumed in our life trying to pursue uh, the better job, the money, the promotion, the accumulation of things. We can do that to the point that our life gets out of kilter. Because Ephesians 3, I want you to listen to Ephesians 3, cha chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Everybody say, in us. Men shout in us. Yeah. See, the power of God is working in you. To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. This says that God is able to do exceedingly, think about this. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you guys can ask, that we guys can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Not according to the outward circumstances of what's going on, but according to the power that works in us. In other words, God wants to give you the promotion in you before you see the promotion out there. God wants to bless you in here before you see it out there. And so you're destined for greatness. And so many men, after they get in their 40s, 
50s, even their 60s, a lot of men start going through a weird phase where we start getting depressed or we start getting anxious. We start getting weird because what's happened is we, we just feel like that we're not accomplishing everything that God had for our future. And so then we start scrambling in our flesh to try to get some things to happen, not realizing that what God wants to do in you, how God wants to promote you, how God wants to bless you, what God wants to bless you with, what God wants to do in your future, first of all, has to be birthed on the inside of you. It's according to the power that's inside of you. Amen. So when you have Jesus Christ on the inside of you, then you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. When you have Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, then things start happening in God's timetable according to God's purpose and God's plan and God's destiny for you. And if we start scratching, if we, if we start getting anxious because we're not seeing everything that we thought we would see on the timetable we thought we would see it, and we start getting anxious, then what happens is we start making some really stupid mistakes. I know guys that have <clears throat> been married for 30 years, 35 years, to a loving, faithful wife, but then they start going through this crisis and they leave their wife to go marry some younger gal about 20, 25 years younger because they think that is going to propel them toward their destiny. Not realizing they just lost their best friend. To look for outward validation is limiting yourself because God's plans and purposes birthed on the inside of us first are birthed first on the inside of us when we see and say who we are in Christ. So men, I want to say fourthly that God has destined you for greatness and he has placed that greatness on the inside of you. It's inside of you. It's not in your outward circumstances. And the outward circumstances will come to pass. The job will come to pass. The raise will come to pass. The, the promotion will come to pass. The things that you need. or The Bible even says whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Even the things that you desire. All those things are there, but they all happen. They all occur according to what's on the inside. What God's placed on the inside. You got that, guys? I want to ask all the men to stand, please, because I want to pray for you, if you will. Uh, any men who will, who would, any men that are in here, I want to pray for you guys. Being a man today is an honorable thing, and I'm so proud of each one of you. There's a lot to deal with. You know, you hear messages like this, and you think, well... I don't measure up here and I don't measure up there and I didn't do this and I got to change that. And if we're not careful, we get really, really down on ourselves. But I want to tell you today that being a man of God today in today's society with what's going on in the world today is so honorable. It's so noble and you are to be applauded. Ladies, I said you are to be applauded. Father, I thank you for the gentlemen that are in our congregation today, these men of God, these great, great men of God. I ask you, God, that you would bless them, bless their families, bless their homes, bless their relationships with their spouses, their wives, bless their relationship with their children. And God, give us wisdom. And Holy Spirit, I ask you that you would encourage us on the inside to be able to stand up and be who you've called us to be. The world has tried to beat us down. Sometimes our employment, our bosses have tried to beat us down. Even our culture has tried to beat us down as we, as we look at the, at the wimps and the sorry examples of manhood that we see in the media and we see on television and, and we see in other areas of life. God, thank you for what you've called us to. And we're... we're we're called to a higher standard than just what our culture says we can be or what we should aspire to. Holy Spirit, bless, anoint, empower, encourage each man standing here today. In Jesus' name.
Amen. I applaud you, man. Amen. You may be seated. I uh, want to say one more time, I just, I'm looking for another opportunity somewhere in my message to get this out and show it to you. Because I just, I think that's, actually Deanne, I have to give Deanne credit, she found this. I said, find me a screwdriver. And so she found me, I said, what's that? I need a screwdriver. And she said, open it up, it is. So anyway, it's just, uh, go home and tighten down your air conditioner unit with this. And it might save you some, some money. Anyway, I want to also give you, I want to ask everyone to stand right now. Guys, gave you a break there, but I want to ask everyone to stand. The greatest father anybody can ever have is our father involved in our life. There is a God. His son Jesus Christ came to earth and died for our sins. And you know, that can seem so nebulous, so out there, so otherworldly, so, you know, we, people, people struggle all the time and deal with, do I believe that or not? Do I believe there's a God or do I not believe there's a God? Listen, Christianity goes so much farther than that. Christianity goes to the point where God, your father, wants to be involved in your life. It's not just do I believe in him? Do I not believe in him? Okay, I believe in him, so I guess that makes me a Christian. God loves you, and the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, wants to be a father to you. I have a great father. I have a great earthly father. But Jesus Christ wants to be the father to you that no man can be on this earth. He wants to forgive you, love you, empower you, the Holy Spirit wants to put you over in every area of your life. And Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came and died on the cross for your sins so that you could spend eternity with your Heavenly Father. Spend eternity with your Heavenly Father. He loves you that much. Would you bow your heads, please, with me? Close your eyes for just a moment. God created us to fellowship with him. God has always wanted to be our father. God didn't just all of a sudden one day when he sent Jesus say, you know what, I think I'll be their father. God has always wanted to be our father. But Satan has come to deceive us. Satan came to take God's children, to take God's birthright. And so he sent Jesus Christ to make the sacrifice for our, for our sins so that we could be the children of God again, so that we could have that relationship with God as our Father. Because of sin that was introduced by the devil, everybody was separated from God. We were born into a world of sin. But Jesus Christ came and paid that price for your sin with his death on the cross so that you could be free to serve him, free to fulfill your destiny in God, free to spend eternity with him. And what I want to ask you to do today is make a decision to follow Christ. Make a decision to let the Holy Spirit come in and live on the inside of you and empower you to be the child of God again that the Bible promises you that you can be. You can do that right there where you're standing. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer with you, repenting for your sins, acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and asking your Heavenly Father to send the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you. So while every head's bowed and every eye's closed, everybody that wants to pray this prayer with me, everybody that wants to acknowledge your Heavenly Father, everybody that wants to be adopted back in to the family of God, with God as your heavenly father. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right there where you are. Everybody that wants to do that, I want you to raise your hand. Right there where you are, I'm going to pray this prayer right there where you are, right now. Thank you, Jesus. Raise your hand now. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't see any hands, so would you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that at every service, here at Living Word, people make decisions to follow Christ. As we bring our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, and our relatives to church with us, we thank you that you're here to draw them into the kingdom of God, that they might experience what we have experienced. 
eternal life in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.